communicate any tips of that from anybody towards y'all? Y'all have plenty to eat? Got some, got some sun? I enjoyed it. Had my children all in my house. Oh, yeah. It was a good weekend for me. Um, ready to continue on. The defense still presenting the left side of the case. So we'll start on. If y'all need a break, this is two hours and 10, 12 minutes. Yes, sir. We'll try to get it all done in one run, and we'll take a break. A lengthy one, okay? And if something happens in that, get my attention, okay? Yeah. Right, the defense calls Dr. Lippman. He's testifying by video. Um, to a scheduling conflict, we videotape his testimony here in this courtroom. This will be presented just like we did the um, other gentleman from um, Las Vegas. Yes, sir. Solemnly swear or affirm the testimony about the bill shall be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Stop it out. I do. Have a seat right up there, sir. Once you're seated, doctor, state your full name, spell your last name. My name is Jonathan Joseph Lipman, L I P M A N. And what is your profession? Uh, I'm a neuropharmacologist. And you tell the jury, what is a neuropharmacologist? A neuropharmacologist is a person who is uh, trained in the expertise of dealing with the effects of drugs on nerve, brain, and behavior. Some of us work in industry developing, researching these new drugs. Um, some of us work in academia, and um, some of us consult clinically. Let me go over your educator. Can you go over your educational background, please? Yes, sir. My uh, educational background is originally British, so it differs in some ways from the American trajectory. My um, <clears throat> My advanced level certificates of education came from Kipson College of Science in Leeds, England. I went on to do my professional degree at the Hatfield Polytechnic in Hertfordshire. Uh, it's now known as uh, Hertfordshire University. It changed its name. I did my externship at the National Hospital for Nervous Diseases in Queen Square, London and um, obtained my state certification as a biomedical scientist, as well as my professional degree in 1979. I went on then to do my doctoral work at the University of Wales, Institute of Science and Technology, obtaining a PhD in neuropharmacology. Um, excuse me, I just misspoke. It was my PhD that I graduated in 1979, forgive me. Um, and I then went to do a, a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Tennessee Center for the Health Sciences in Memphis, Tennessee. And over the ensuing years, I uh, continued to acquire um, additional education and board certifications uh, as I moved through my academic and other professional positions. Can you tell me about your registrations and or certifications? Uh, well, I mentioned, of course, my um, biomedical science uh, certification in England. I am certified also in England by the Healthcare Professions Council, uh, which is a national organization that controls healthcare professionals. Um, over the years that I was at uh, the University of Tennessee Center for the Health Sciences and later Vanderbilt University, where I held positions for 10 years in the departments of medicine and surgery. I obtained additional training and qualifications, becoming board certified as a, by the uh, American Board of Disability Analysts, the um, medical psychotherapists and um, psychometricians and the American College of Forensic Examiners, a number of different boards. And the education still continues. It does not stop. 
Um, I moved from Vanderbilt to join industry after 10 years at Vanderbilt and um, worked in the pharmaceutical industry and the medical device development field for 10 years before rejoining academia at East Tennessee State University where I now am on the faculty, clinical faculty, and continue to consult with industry and the courts. So you went through school, at some point in time you went into private practice, private industry for a period of time, as you said, and then back to academia. Yes, academia, though continue, continuing to consult in neuropharmacology outside of the academic setting, in addition to uh, academic work and research and development. And, and you said that you had gone in, in 10 years in, the, I guess, the business aspect of it. What did you do during that 10 years? I was head of pharmacology for the first year of that time at a company that was spun off from Abbott Laboratories. It was called Medical um, Molecular Geriatrics. We were developing drugs that were based on antipsychotic molecules <coughs> for neurological purposes, um, and then transitioned to a medical device development track for neuroscience tool works, developing devices and methods for assessing subjective states of pain and suffering in humans. Um, by um, objective methods. So were you developing drugs then? To, to do At that point, we were, uh, the devices and methods that we were using were uh, to assess the effectiveness of drugs that we were then not developing. We were developing the methods of assessing them. So basically figuring out, are, are these things that people have developed, are they working? Yes. Uh, one of the principal interests was pain medicines which of course takes you into the area of addiction and dependence and withdrawal. Do you have any professional affiliations? Um, I'm currently affiliated with East Tennessee State University, as I, as I mentioned. Yes, sir. Um, I have a, a, a list of previous affiliations, um, no longer current. Uh, kind of hit the highlights of those? Well, I mentioned the first, which was the Institute of Neurology, um, Department of Neurosurgical Studies at the National Hospital for Nervous Diseases in Queen Square, London. Um, and then um, through my departments uh, at uh, University of Tennessee Center for the Health Sciences, my affiliations were with the anesthesiology department, the biochemistry department, and the faculty medical practice pain clinic. Um, at Vanderbilt, I was affiliated with, formerly affiliated with the Departments of Medicine and Surgery and maintained an adjunct position for some years after that. I'm not sure if it's still current, um, possibly not after this time. Uh, with uh, work that I was doing with the Department of Neurosurgery on pain assessment and pain treatment methods in chronic pain and intractable pain patients. And there developed uh, several methods for objective measurement of pain, addiction, withdrawal. Um, as I mentioned, I was group leader at Molecular Geriatrics Corporation, which was a spin-off of Abbott Labs. Um, at the <clears throat> university now, I hold a number of positions. <coughs> um, well, I'm on the Grand Rounds Committee for the Department of Psychiatry. Um, I'm affiliated with the Department of Continuing Medical Education therein. I um, also am, last year I was well, one of the coordinators for the forensics course in the psychiatry residency program and also a lecturer on that program, and I'm uh, still a lecturer on that program. This is in the postgraduate training of psychiatrists. You mentioned um, continuing education. Can you tell us about any of the lecture seminars or presentations that you have given? I'd have to look at my own CV. There are some. There are many. Um, Could you just give us a thumbnail of a few? Uh, the antidepressant drug pipeline was one that I gave a couple of years ago. Uh, genetic testing and pain management 
uh, was a, a lecture I gave the previous year as part of a, a one-day seminar for, actually it was not just East Tennessee, it was just held there, it was from people from all over. Um, I gave uh, a grand rounds that same year on pharmacogenetics. Um, I have given a lecture entitled Update on Recent Trends in Drug Ab Abused Drugs. And uh, in 2014, new and future drugs of abuse. Um, one was given to the US Criminal Justice Administration called Drug Abuse Addiction in the Brain, Forensic Relevance. Um, I could go on, but uh, the, the many. Do, do you hold any hats? I do. I, was, I hold several. Uh, both in the U.S. and abroad, on pain assessment methods, uh, international patents, and um, I believe Canadian. Have you ever participated in any peer re or reviewed research grants? Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Um, well, throughout my time at Vanderbilt, uh, I was the beneficiary of numerous grants assessing the effects of dementia and of drugs on the brain. Uh, some of these came from the Division of Toxicology. It's called the Program in Toxicology. Some from the National Institutes of Health. Um, one was with uh, UCLA, Los Angeles, VA, on um, dialysis dementia. Um, uremic encephalopathy funding uh, that I was part of at Vanderbilt came from Dialysis Clinics Incorporated, a private organization that was funding my work on the brain in uh, dementing patients. Um, at, uh, after leaving Vanderbilt, the work that I was doing in Chicago with molecular geriatrics and with neuroscience tool works was funded through the National Institutes of Health. Uh, these were quite large grants. One and a quarter million was one, um, 850,000 was another, to fund our work there on the development of methods for assessing the effects of drugs. Um, I think that might have been my last NIH funded grant. Have you ever been published? Oh, well, yes. Would it be fair to say about six pages of your CV or? articles that you have been published? Yes, it, it is. Uh, these are, the, what's in my CV are just the peer-reviewed ones, uh, but there are more than this, some of which were not in peer-reviewed journals. Judge, at this time, we would offer Dr. Lippman as an expert in neuropharmacology. We're done. Mr. Graham? No, we're not at this time, Your Honor. Considering his background, training, education, experience in all fields, facets of the as shown in his testimony, the court will qualify him in the field of neuropharmacology to provide testimony to that end. Uh, Dr. Lippman, can we've heard from a forensic toxicologist, can you tell me what the difference is between a forensic toxicologist and a neuropharmacologist is? Yes. Um, toxicologists uh, have their expertise in the measurement of drug effects in body fluids, body tissues, uh, biological samples, the analytical methods. To some extent, their training includes the poisoning effects of those drugs. Um, the difference between a drug effect and a poison effect of that drug is one largely of dose. Now, pharmacologists have their expertise in the mechanism of action of drugs, therapeutic and adverse, how they work, and um, how they interact. We are the people, for instance, that test drugs prior to marketing. We are the people that um, perform post-marketing surveillance of drug effects in the population being prescribed. 
and pharmacologists are also the people who research, develop, and design these drugs. Um, now, in, in the process of that, some of, of our training is in the measurement of those drug effects, uh, uh, sorry, a measurement of those drug concentrations in tissues, but that is not our principal focus. Uh, so there is a certain amount of toxicological training in a pharmacological career, but it isn't our main focus, whereas that is the main focus of a toxicologist. We rather deal with the effects of drugs, measuring the effects of drugs, assessing the effects of drugs, and in the treatment of disease, uh, we, such as psychiatric disease, um, we assess the efficacy of the drug, the effectiveness of it, and of drug interactions. Let me ask you this. As a neuropharmacologist, when looking at the effects of drugs, initially, what is important to you to look at as far as background? Well, drug effects uh, are determined more than by dose. Um, drug effects have very individual determinants of drug action. Uh, in other words, it depends who is who the drug is acting upon as to what the effect will be. Uh, drugs produce different effects in different people. And the effect of a drug is, is influenced then by factors such as their underlying medical condition, their um, underlying genetic predispositions, their underlying metabolic capabilities, um, underlying disease states will completely change the effect of a drug. Um, there are a number of other determinants, but uh, also relevant to the examination of a drug at the time of, of inspection is the set and setting of drug use, because that also determines the effect. How so? Uh, the set and setting are, the set is what you bring to the drug experience, and the setting is the experience uh, is, is this, this milieu surrounding the effect of drug action. So just to give you an example of how, how setting can be relevant, um, antipsychotic drugs that are very helpful and therapeutic in a, a controlled milieu in a psychiatric ward may be completely useless in the chaos of everyday life with traffic and people and responsibilities and um, noise and family and uh, intrusions. The milieu, the setting, has a lot to do with how effective the drug will be. And the converse is, is, is also true. Not only may a therapeutic drug lose its, uh, its benefits in the wrong milieu, but uh, a drug that could be relatively innocuous, um, for instance, LSD, um, a psychotomimetic drug, um, can produce catastrophic effects if the milieu is threatening, frightening, uncontrolled, and that would be called a bad trip. The dose hasn't changed, the drug hasn't changed, but the setting has changed the effect of the drug. So set and setting are um, important determinants of how a drug expresses its effect on an individual. Did you have an opportunity to review documents in reference to the life history of Tim Jones? Yes, I did. And why is that important to you? Uh, well, as I explained, the, the, uh, the underlying medical, psychological, psychiatric, genetic, familial uh, condition of the individual can determine in large part the effect of a drug. And you also reviewed information about a traumatic brain injury that Tim suffered during his pre-adult years? Correct. That, that as I said, medical. Um, yeah, for a drug that um, acts on the brain, it's very important to know how the brain is, um, is functioning to start with. And you also reviewed his relevant psychiatric history? Yes. And also his relevant drug abuse history? Yes, I have. And why would the drug abuse history be important? For a number of reasons. Um, one reason is that depending on other factors, the effect of a drug at a certain time of interest, when we examine that time of interest, um, 
may be related to the effect of the drug historically. Uh, in some cases, that may have a, um, an effect, for instance, like tolerance in, uh, in alcohol use. A person who uses it regularly will develop some tolerance and will not be as intoxicated at a blood level that we measure at the time of interest because they are tolerant to it. Unlike a person who has never had alcohol and who then achieves the same blood level and is unable to get up off the floor. So the history of drug use is relevant from that point of view and it's also relevant because prior drug use can affect other things such as the development of the brain, the development of the liver, um, the development of certain cognitive and uh, other factors, and depending on the age at which it is used, it will have different effects. Therefore, the history of drug use is relevant to an examination of how a drug acts at a particular time. And I believe you reviewed information about Tim's uh, marijuana use during his pre-adulthood years? Yes, I did. And also, I guess, in the last couple of months, um, prior to August, his use of synthetic cannabinoids? Yes, I did review that. And besides the, and I guess when I say synthetic cannabinoids, marijuana is also a cannabinoid? Marijuana contains cannabinoid drugs. And then you also reviewed um, information in reference to Chantix? I did. He was prescribed that at the time of this uh, offense. Um, can you just... Before we get into the background, can you give me your opinion on what you believe um, Tim's drug use had on his thinking and his behavior at the time of his killing of children? Of his children? I believe that his use of synthetic cannabinoid AB Panaka more likely than not exacerbated his pre-existing and his continuing psychosis spectrum mental illness, uh, which drove his irrational behavior. So. Let's kind of back up now and just kind of talk about um, the pharmacology of cannabis. Um, <coughs> can you just kind of run us through um, kind of how, is it just that drug or any drug works on uh, with affinity and efficacy? Can, can you kind cannabis, of explain that to the jury? Can, cannabis contains a number of different drugs. Uh, it contains quite a few. Um, two of them we think of as the main ones. Future research may reveal more. Um, what are the two main ones? Cannabidiol and Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol. Is that what right. Yeah. For the record, let's get it. Spell it for joy. C A N N A B I N O L. So it's Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol. Can cannabinol. Okay. T E T R A H Y D R O. I mean, I can't hear you. T E T R A H Y D R O C A N N A B I N O L. Okay. Done. Delta nine tetra cannab cannabinoid. Is that what we would kind of on the street call THC, or I'll yes, would refer to that as THC? Yes, it's usually called THC. So that's one of the um, components. What was the other one? Uh, cannabidiol, C-A-N-N-A-B-I-D-I-O-L. And what is that? Uh, that doesn't act on the same receptor as the THC, um, and it exerts different effects. In fact, uh, the effects are very, very different and um, are currently being evaluated for use as potentially antipsychotic drugs. And yet, both of them are in the same plant, uh, along with others that that may have effects we haven't yet elucidated properly. And so both of those things are inside of just regular marijuana? To some extent, some, some marijuana species more than others, yes. And can you explain to the jury how you can determine the power of a cannabinoid um, to invoke effects at, at a receptor? And I guess we need to start with kind of explaining what is a receptor and how those Yes, work. let me explain that. Um, there's a reason why cannabis acts on the brain. Can I start there? Yes, please. How does it act on the brain? The brain has receptors for cannabis, uh, for cannabinoids. And the reason it has receptors is because uh, 
the human physiology manufactures its own cannabinoids. And they have very important purposes in brain function. These are, these, we call them endocannabinoids. Um, they are involved in the regulation of temperature, body temperature, blood pressure. They're involved in the regulation of perception. Um, they're involved in memory. And they are neurotransmitters, which our brain relies on to function, these endocannabinoids. The, um, the first to be identified and synthesized was one called anandamide. Uh, A-N- A-N-A-N-D, A-N-I-D-E. Uh, and of course, it was um, tested for possible use in humans as a therapeutic drug. Be that as it may, the point is that our brain possesses receptors for endocannabinoids. And it is of those receptors that the cannabinoids in marijuana act. A receptor is a patch on a neuron which, when activated, produces a signal in that nerve. The receptor has a very specific shape, and only things that will fit that shape will bind to the receptor. Is that kind of like a lock and a key going together? Yes, you might think of the, the receptor as being the lock and the chemical, either anandamide or THC or a synthetic, as being the key. When the combination occurs between the neurotransmitter and the receptor, it occurs with a certain vigor that is measurable by neuropharmacologists, a certain attraction. Think of it as the strength of a magnet, maybe. Um, and we call that uh, attractiveness of the receptor for the neurotransmitter, we call that affinity. It's a measurable thing. Um, different drugs have different affinities for the receptor. And yet, in order to evoke an effect, simply combining with the receptor is not enough. It must also provoke a response. And what is that called when it provokes that response? That, is, that response is also measurable, and that is called the efficacy of the neurotransmitter or the drug. So whether a drug produces an effect or not. What? How do you spell that? The efficacy. He said the British way. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. Yeah. I, I knew what you said. I'm British for it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. She didn't, she's never heard it pronounced that way. She knows how to spell it. I know how to spell it. I just didn't know exactly what he said. I apologize. Okay. So the efficacy, can you again explain that? Yes. Affinity and efficacy, as we would say it in England, are measurable metrics in relation to the action of a drug or a neurotransmitter on a receptor in the brain. Now, um, when a drug produces a post-receptor action as a result of its binding, its affinity, and its effect, its efficacy, we call that an agonist drug. Um, it's a product of affinity and efficacy, efficacy yes. Um, not all drugs produce such effects, and an example, for instance, of something that antagonizes an agonist, we call them antagonist drugs, is a drug that perhaps has high affinity to bind with the receptor, will perhaps even displace the first drug from the receptor, but it has itself no efficacy. All it can do is bind. And I think we've all heard of Narcon or Narco. Naloxone, Narcan, is an example of an opiate drug that has high affinity but no efficacy. Therefore, it competes with morphine for the opiate receptor, but it doesn't produce a morphine-like effect itself. And this ends the morphine action. 
by displacing it. So it has no efficacy, it has high affinity. Whereas morphine itself has high affinity and high efficacy, it goes into the, the lock and it activates it. So basically the, the Narcan is kicking the morphine out of that receptor and that's kind of how it works and brings people back and as it's stronger and has more affinity and, and it has... It has more affinity but no efficacy. An example, just to complete the metaphor, or the, the example so it's more, heroin has a higher affinity and a higher efficacy than morphine. If a person is under the influence of morphine, heroin can displace that and produce a greater effect because they're both agonists. They both have um, receptor binding capability and receptor activation capability. Narcan binds, but it has no effect, no efficacy, so it displaces. Okay, so in dealing with THC, you had mentioned that it is an agonist at a receptor. Do we know what that receptor is? What is, what is, or what is it called? Yeah, uh, well, all of the receptors, and there are a number of receptors for the cannabinoids, are called the C, CB receptors. Um, the one that THC acts on is the CB1 receptor. It's present in the hippocampus of the brain, it's present throughout the limbic system, and I mentioned earlier, it, it has some very lower brain function um, areas that it is binding to, because that's where anandamide binds, the endogenous cannabinoid that we make ourselves. And when, um, when we talk about um, an agonist, is there a difference between a partial agonist and a full agonist? Yes, there is. Uh, the efficacy and the affinity may not be 100%. There are some drugs that will bind with great avidity to the receptor, and you can't get them off. Uh, some will bind gently, and they can be bumped off by competing agents. Some will bind strongly and aggressively produce an effect. Um, in a sense, when both affinity and efficacy are at maximum, we have what we call a full agonist drug. Would THC be a full agonist to that CB1? It is not. It is a partial agonist. It is um, weaker than a full agonist at binding to the receptor and at producing post-receptor effects. And that's the natural occurring THC found in, say, marijuana, correct? Yes. Yes, it's a partial agonist. It's not a full agonist. What about the synthetic cannabinoids? Do those act on that same uh, CP1 receptor? They do. They do. Um, of course, they are not accompanied by the other compounds found in marijuana because they are synthetic. Uh, they are just modifications of the shape of the THC molecule made by neuropharmacologists and medicinal chemists for research purposes for exploring how the brain works and how therapeutic drugs may be developed. So you had mentioned, say, with marijuana that it has the THC and then some other items. The synthetic marijuana doesn't have those other items, correct? That's correct. And with the synthetic cannabinoids, those then are, are, are a full agonist to that CB1 receptor, not a partial, correct? Uh, the current generation are all full agonists, yes. There are some available that are partial agonists that have been made by medicinal chemists for research purposes. Um, the reason why you would make them is because there is therapeutic potential in the endocannabinoid system. Such as what? Well, um, anorexia, um, sexual dysfunctions, uh, cachexia in cancer, where uh, people just starve themselves to death, um, insomnia in some cases. Uh, there are a number of, of psychiatric illnesses that the cannabinoids have been proposed as potential treatment for, but we couldn't, of course, use THC it's neither specific nor potent enough, and marijuana contains too many compounds anyway. 
And so when we talk about these synthetic cannabinoids, these aren't things that are found in nature. I think you said they're developed in a lab? Yes, intentionally. And those can be used for, as you said, I guess, research? Yes. Would those be kind of classified as almost designer-type drugs? Yes, they're designed uh, by medicinal chemists. So they are designer drugs. And I believe when they started was around, what, 1995? Uh, yes. Uh, the first one was uh, developed by uh, J.W. Huffman. And the drug that, uh, or a family of drugs, are all called the JWH drugs, uh, because he named them. And um, JWH 017 and 018 were, I think, the first drugs that managed to escape from the lab, as it were, and find themselves in um, street use. So when we talk about, can you kind of give me an idea as far as the synthetic cannabinoids, how many generations are we now talking about since those, I guess, in your words, escaped from lab? It would have to be dozens. Um, I, about a year ago, I tracked how many uh, new molecular entities are, and you, each of them is, is really a different generation. And um, the number then was 150. And that was a year ago? That was a year ago. And uh, they no longer really resemble THC at all, either in their effect or, or in their pharmacology. So at one point in time, if I go in buying synthetic marijuana a few years ago and think I'm basically getting legal weed, am I off my rocker? Not entirely, but you're not getting legal weed. You will be getting a very selective effect due to a selective part of the marijuana experience. It, is, it would lack, for instance, the cannabidiol that, that marijuana contains. Is that CBD oil? S yes. Kind of, I mean, in layman's terms, is that? The, the oil uh, uh, presumably contains CBD. Um, but there is no FDA control over that, except in the case of one legal product, uh, which is used in the treatment of a certain type of childhood epilepsy. That is FDA approved. Um, I have no idea whether or if you will find true cannabidiol in CBD oil that you buy on the street. But yes, that's the intention. But cannabidiol, does that... Um does that affect that same CB1 receptor? Is no, that it does not affect it at all. No, it acts through an entirely different mechanism that really is not related to the intoxication effect of, um, of, of marijuana. And the, the cannabidiol, can, excuse me, can't speak, cannabidiol, you said it doesn't act on that same receptor. That's not found in the synthetic um, marijuana, is it? There's no cannabidiol in synthetic marijuana. They are all analogs, I shouldn't call it, well, it's synthetic cannabinoids is best. Uh, they're all analogs, at least built upon the structure of, of THC, Delta 9 THC. And the cannabidiol, does that, has that been shown to have some antipsychotic properties? Yes, it is, well, it is being evaluated as a, a potent, molecules derived from it, excuse me, uh, not cannabidiol itself, but mo molecules designed by um, pharmacologists and medicinal chemists designed around the cannabidiol molecule are being evaluated for use in treatment of anxiety and psychosis. Can you just um, talk a little bit about, in general, cannabis intoxication? What does it do to a person? Uh, well, it depends so much on the individual. Uh, obviously, it produces euphoria in most people. Um, it increases appetite. Um, it has a range of uh, potential adverse effects. Can you tell me what those are? Yeah, they will affect different people differently, and that relates to their underlying psychological integrity and history. But the um, obviously, the, the, the reason why a person would use marijuana or a synthetic is because they are looking for the dis for the euphoria. But even THC itself produces 
in certain vulnerable people, states of high anxiety, irritability, um, fear, which can be irrational, which can be paranoid. It can also be grandiose. Paranoia is not always a fear. Um, you may feel that you are a supernatural being with uh, angelic powers. That is also a paranoia. Uh, although in the vernacular term, people use the word paranoid to mean only fear. Can it, um, can it cause auditory hallucinations? Yes, it can. And in a large enough dose, even marijuana will do that. And you had mentioned, obviously, I think initially you talked about the set and setting, and you had talked about the effect um, with someone with an underlying psychiatric condition. Can you speak a little bit more on that, what you mean by that? Yes. Um, the drug has different effects on different people, depending on what you might call the, how level the playing field is in their mind. Well, it, it's safe level. Let's start with someone who doesn't have any type of underlying psychotic mental illness. What's going to happen with the, the cannabis intoxication besides the euphoria? I think um, most people have some loose boats in their past, but or in their present or fears. Uh, but the um, the adverse effects, even on a normal person, can resemble uh, can involve panic and um, anxiety, and to some degree, a psychosis-like state that we call psychotomimetic because it isn't true psychosis, but it is like a psychosis, and it is transient. It is in a permanent condition. So it's just maybe, by the intoxication? Yes, it's the adverse effects of the intoxication. And just for the court reporter, when you say psychomimetic, that's P-S-Y-C-O? No. How do you spell it? C H C H O T O M I M E T I C. Yes, psychotomimetic. And what is that again? It's mimetic of some psychiatric, psychotic symptomatology, and it's uh, an, a, an adverse effect of the drug. I, in the vernacular, in the street, you will find some people say, "Weed makes me paranoid." Uh, I start to hear police radios, I, um, I think people are following me. That, that is a psychotomimetic effect. And then, of course, after a few hours, it passes off and... And so that would just be totally drug-induced, um, and that's not mental illness, that's just basically, I guess, the effects of the intoxication? Yes, we'd call it an adverse effect. Some people would call it a side effect. Um, it depends on the individual as to how vulnerable they are to experiencing that. And that's the problem, you see. You're asking me, how, what, does, what are the adverse effects in a normal individual? A normal individual is someone you don't know very well. Um, there's a range of normality in, in normal. Let me ask you this. How does cannabis ex exacerbate a psychotic mental or someone with, a, say, a psychotic mental illness? There are two factors that I have to explain in that regard. OK, please do. Uh, psychosis does not usually emerge um, until quite late in development, usually around age 20 plus. Uh, prior to that, there may be a condition that we call prodromal psychosis. The person is not psychotic, but they are very unusual and magical in their thinking. Um, odd. They may be identifiably odd. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to turn out to be psychotic. The point being that psychosis is something that develops into adulthood. Um, now, we have found from a number of different studies, epidemiological and otherwise, that when cannabis, presumably due to its THC content, is used in early childhood, particularly prior to age 15. The odds of developing psychosis later on, by age 26, according to one study, um, are considerably higher. They're at least threefold higher than normal, which means that 
in part answer to your question of what is the relevance in psychosis, it can have a role in the development of psychosis in the first place. Um, Use of THC in your younger years can potentially increase your risk of developing that psychosis. Yes, it can. And, um, and there's multiple studies on that? There are multiple studies, and uh, of course this is a reason why we should keep marijuana away from children. Uh, because it could produce irreparable effects later on if they are vulnerable to it. But we won't know that they're vulnerable to it until they're in their very late teens. And so you reviewed records um, from other experts indicating that Tim suffers from uh, a, or post, or a psychosis spectrum mental illness, correct? Yes, I did. And... Um, after looking at that, can you just kind of tell me what you can glean from that? Can you clarify your question? Well, let me back up. Um, let me ask you this. People with a, a post-spectrum mental illness, what is their experience as far as the use of cannabinoids, as far as the, the pleasure bowl? Oh, I see what you're asking. Yes, it's, it's, it's somewhat ironic um, in that we know that in schizophrenics, for instance, um, marijuana use makes their psychosis worse, and yet they claim that it relieves their dysphoric mood. When you say dysphoric, what do you mean? Unhappiness. Um, and I don't dispute that it, it may alleviate some of their dysphoric mood, but the problem that they're suffering from is not primarily a mood disorder. It is that they're out of contact with reality, and that is exacerbated by cannabis. So people with psychotic illnesses should not use THC or cannabis, even though they may feel that it is helping their dysphoric mood, their unhappiness, uh, because their underlying psychotic illness is, is, is exacerbated. And when you say exacerbated, can you give me an example or kind of tell me what you mean by that? It's gasoline on the fire of their own. And I, I guess could someone go into that not realizing that they have that underlying vulnerability? Okay, this is this is the point about psychosis. Um, psychotics don't think they are psychotic. They're view of reality is very, very different from ours, but it's their reality. And they don't see themselves as mentally ill, as a rule. Unlike people who have a mood disorder, who know that they're miserable and depressed and crying, that, that is identifiable. But when your thinking is so out of line with um, conventional norms of reality, that can be difficult to identify as an illness. You may think that you are particularly spiritual, for instance, or you may think that you are endowed with certain telepathic powers, or you may think that you are endowed with um, special functions that most humans don't have, but you do not think of yourself as ill. That'd be someone who feels like they can tell when someone's telling the truth, almost like a human lie detector? Yes, that's an example. And then, um, I guess in your experience, have you had times where individuals had something that was kind of going on that was in their life that was kind of mundane, but you, you take a look at that and realize that it's underlying psychosis? Yes. Um, oftentimes, uh, let, let me point out that psychotic people of the schizophrenic variety are very often highly intelligent. Um, but usually they are described as odd, um, idiosyncratic, um, a little weird, and their behavior may not be entirely congruent with what is typical, but um, maybe not enough to start the alarm bells running in people's minds. Uh, but an example that I could give you of a, a fellow that I evaluated who had this odd way of walking downstairs. I would object at 
time you're on an irrelevant. I'm going to allow Dion, overall. He had an odd way of walking down stairs whereby he would step on the front leading edge of the step. Uh, it looked kind of dangerous, actually. And uh, he would touch the banister with his fingertips only, and he would zip up and zip down the stairs. And it seemed a little odd. You know, people thought he's odd. Uh, but when, you, when I inquired of why does he do that, he explained that he has the ability to see gray, sticky clouds of what he called psychic shit that adheres to wood, such as the wood of the stairs, but not the rubber edge of the stair, and to the banister, but not to the banister rail. And he was manipulating his life so as to not touch any of this gray, sticky cloud of evil in his mind, which, of course, we cannot see. So, yes, he looked a little odd, and his movements were a little strange, but the underlying reason for it was psychotic. In reviewing his records, I believe he said it looks like over a period of time that Tim's um, drug of choice was marijuana. Yes. Although he started using synthetic cannabinoids, um, did you review a toxicology screen done on him or on his blood by NMS Labs? Yes, I did. Seven, and that was positive for AV Panaka? Yes. And then you also reviewed some testing from the Mississippi Crime Lab that tested some Scoopy Snacks um, out of his car, correct? Yes, yeah, something labeled Scoopy Snacks, yes. And that also tested for by them AV Panaka? It did, yes. And then you actually requested a, a an additional test or a, a confirmatory test from M N M S Labs, I guess more of a comprehensive. Yes, I wanted uh, not just come confirmation of the AB Panaka, but there has, was evidence coming across my my desk that uh, some of the synthetic cannabinoids containing AB Panaka also contained other synthetic cannabinoids, and so I asked that they be um, that the sample be examined to see if that was the case with this sample also. And I think you had said earlier that AB Panaka, what would the AB stand for in that? Usually it's uh, related to the medical, uh, the medicinal chemist who has developed the drug or the company that has developed the drug. In fact, AB Panaka was developed by Pfizer Labs and patent, patented by them in 2009. And did you tell me about AB Panaka? It is a pure agonist, unlike THC. And it has um, vastly greater potency as a combination of affinity and efficacy on the CB1 receptor. Uh, there are different ways of measuring that affinity and that efficacy, but it is of the order of uh, possibly 20 times, and in some examples of research, uh, many more times more potent than THC itself. And it is not a partial agonist, it is a full agonist. So it would be stronger than, say, naturally occurring THC? It would actually displace naturally occurring THC from the brain. And you had said something about with marijuana, is it cannab cannabidioids, the other compounds that it had? It doesn't have any other compounds. It's a pure THC agonist at the CB1 receptor. And um, so if, if I use AB Panaka, how long are the effects going to last? Uh, they typically, the, the high typically lasts about 10 hours. Um, we haven't got pharmacokinetic studies in humans of AB Panaka. They haven't been published. If they have been done, the, uh, that means that no one has actually given it to normal volunteers, as far as I can tell in the published literature, and measured their blood level and their effect over time. We've done that for the other compounds, the early ones. I mentioned the early synthetic JWH-017 and 018. That's been done at ad nauseum. Um, but 
uh, as far as I know, no one has published, they may have done the research, but they haven't published it, on measuring the um, blood level related to the mental effect. Uh, we know how it's metabolized, uh, for instance, in the liver, but that doesn't tell us anything at all about its duration of action in the brain. Many drugs, for instance, uh, disappear from blood, not because they're being excreted, but because they're being deposited in brain or other body tissues. So to see it disappearing in blood does not mean it has necessarily stopped acting on the brain. And so the exacerbating effects of the drug, once I have used it and it has been deposited somewhere, is, is that done? I mean, are there still effects? There are still effects, yes. What could those be? Well, it, it, okay. Drugs are metabolized. Um, an example, for instance, if I could just uh, compare it, say, with THC. Um, THC from marijuana is metabolized ultimately to carboxy THC. Now, t carboxy THC is inactive. It doesn't act on the brain, but it is deposited in fat, including, presumably, including uh, the myelin fat around the nerves. And it leaches out of body fat for a period of, well, it, many days. Uh, in a person who is a regular user of marijuana, who isn't using it anymore, from the time that they stop, their urine level, for instance, uh, will go down about 15 nanogram per mil per day for a month or more. And yet they are not high, and the cannabidiol is leaching out of their body tissues into their urine, and thus um, being excreted. Now, that uh, cannabidiol, as I said, is a metabolite of THC, but it is inactive. Uh, we do not have that situation with AB Panaca. The metabolites of AB Panaca are active. They are THC-like, they are well, they're AB Panaca-like. And um, so to show that the drug is converted to its metabolite does not, of course, mean that it is now inactivated. In the case of AB Panaca, unlike the case of THC, that's likely an activation. The same is true of many therapeutic drugs. Prozac. Prozac is not an active drug. The metabolite of Prozac is the active drug. Um, so to see it being converted by metabolism into its, into its metabolite uh, is to actually see the, the active drug being created. So the exacerbating effect of a drug on someone with an underlying psychotic illness, does that necessarily dissipate when the drug clears? Let me just clarify what I wanted to say a moment ago. Um, I was actually uh, intending to use the word risperidone, risperidone because that's an antipsychotic drug, not Prozac. Um, the therapeutic effect of it is therefore maintained by its metabolite. Um, here we have uh, an intoxicating drug, AB Panaca, and its metabolites are active. Now, it's not a therapeutic drug at the moment, but um, it's an example of how metabolism can actually continue the effect of a drug. So I think I've answered your question that we don't know what the pharmacokinetics are. They're very complicated because the metabolites are active and they have not, as far as I know, by publication, been measured in humans. Okay. And so if someone has a kind of a, a underlying psychotic illness, what can AB Panaka do to them? Uh, it will make it very much worse. And because it's an underlying psychotic illness, it is subject to becoming unstable and getting worse. Do you have kind of an analogy for that? Well, um, you might think of, say, a, a, an acrobat walking on a high wire. Um, this would be maybe the psychotic, in some state of balance, going to work, living a life with very unusual thoughts. Um, if the drug then pushes them off the high wire, uh, 
they, their underlying illness in this metaphor is made vastly worse. And that exacerbation continues after the drug has left the system. The exacerbation is not simply a matter of intoxication on top of an illness. The illness is made worse by the intoxication. The underlying mental illness is made worse. So to make an analogy compared to, say, alcohol intoxication would not be appropriate. Uh, acute alcohol intoxication would not be appropriate, but uh, there is actually an analogy in alcohol in that um, where uh, we have populations of people who used to be alcoholics and some of the VA domiciliary units are filled with these people, um, their alcohol intoxication has damaged their brain. They are no longer drinking, but they are no longer normal, and they are demented. And their intoxication continues until death, but there is no alcohol there. Can you tell me, were you, or were you able to determine the legality of A.B. Panaka in South Carolina in 2014? Yes, it was legal. I did research that. And can you tell me when it became illegal? The FDA published um, an announcement. Um, you know, I'd have to look it up. Uh, but it was, I think, the following year. Okay. Um, maybe even later. Uh, How about, um, we know that Tim was given Chantix. Can you describe to the jury what Chantix is? Yes, I can. And I guess Chantix is a, that is not the name of the drug, is it? That's the... <laughs> That's the trade name. That's the trade name? Yeah. So what is it? Um, Chantix, the, the, the actual drug is called Varenicline. <sighs> Oddly, it's also made by Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, the company that patented AB Panaka. Um, it is a synthetic drug, but it is based on a natural compound called cystine that is found in the scotch broom, a shrub. And um, cystine has a nicotine-like effect on the, on the brain's receptors. In fact, during the Second World War, I believe when uh, tobacco imports from America were halted in Europe, um, scotch broom was used as a smoking material for people who were dependent on nicotine, and it does substitute. So um, obviously, you can't patent a natural product. Therefore, the company made a modification of that molecule and called it Varenicline, and uh, trademarked it as Chantix. So and Chantix is used to help people stop smoking. Yes. Is there, um, were there any neuropsychiatric problems associated with it? Yes, indeed, there were. Can you tell me about those? Uh, well, they emerged in the pre-market approval. Um, the, um, they were so serious with uh, attempted suicides, depression, psychosis, hallucinations, that in applying for a license to market the drug, to the Food and Drug Administration. The Food and Drug Administration insisted that they put what's called a black box warning. Dr. Lippman, let me show you what's been marked as state, or excuse me, defense exhibit the number 124 for ID purposes and ask you if you recognize that. Yes, I do. And is that referred to as a black box warning? Yes, it is. And was that on Chantix? Uh, yes, it was. Judge, we would move Defense 124 into evidence. Any, ob any objection, Ms. Mays? No objection, Dr. 124 Defense Exhibit is admitted with that objection. What was 123? 123 is uh, it's, it's in our Okay, okay, that's right. And, and 
Yeah. Okay. I was going to show you what's been marked as defendants 121. And I believe that 124 is just a blow up of this very small writing. You can read that. I would read a hand lens, but it looks like one. And so, Doctor, can you tell me what is a black box? Warning. Um, it's a requirement of the Food and Drug Administration, and they are not common. In order to obtain marketing approval of a drug through the Food and Drug Administration, what the Food and Drug Administration actually controls is, apart from the purity and quality of the drug itself, is what's called the label. The label is what um, most people would call the package insert. And this contains detailed instructions to the practitioner, to the patient, to the pharmacist, regarding uh, what the Food and Drug Administration believes and the company has agreed, the users and the practitioners need to know. Most labels don't have a black box warning. A black box warning is potentially a reason to keep a drug off the market unless it is black boxed. And that is um, that there, there is complete disclosure that there is a problem with this drug, and that is put on the black box in the labeling. And that is on Defense 121. Yes. Correct. And can you read that? Yes, sir. Oh, no, we don't. Well, he, we, he does not need to read all that. Okay. Uh, it is verbose and lengthy, but it's part of the package in the Chantix box, which is Exhibit 121 for the record. Okay. Um, Dr. Lippman, are there different types of Chantix? Is it sold different ways? There's only one way that I know, but uh, that way involves several different doses. The, um, the patient is given what's called a starter pack, and the starter pack, this has green coloration, contains 11 doses of 0.5 milligram, half a milligram, to begin treatment, and 42 tablets of one milligram tablets to be used in the continuing weeks after the initial week. And the process begins with taking one white pill, that's half a milligram, daily for days one through three, followed by one white half a milligram pill twice daily on days four through seven. And thereafter, the patient takes continuation doses of one blue pill, that's a milligram, twice daily. Now, the... Um, Subsequent doses are all of the latter type. They are all blue one milligram doses. So if I had a pack of Chantix that was in, say, a green box, that's kind of the starter. That's a starter box, yes. And then the kind of continuation is the blue box. Yes, you would not be touching the blue box until you had finished the starter box or you'd become quite ill. And then was the black box eventually removed from Chantix? It's a different kind of box now. We're talking about the box on the label. Okay. Um, Can you tell me about that? Yes, it was, it was removed in December 2016, following a representation by the company to the Food and Drug Administration that it had performed a study that uh, they argued um, meant that the black box did not, that the information could still be there, but not in a black box. And who funded the study? Uh, Pfizer, the drug company. The people who were producing the drug? Yes. Um, have you reviewed, I guess that study's called the Eagle Study? It is, several publications came uh, as a result of that. I, I've reviewed several of them, not all of them. And, and looking at that as a neuropharmacologist, did you see a problem with that? I did, but in order to explain it, I actually have to, with tolerance of the code, I have to read something from the black box, or it won't make, my answer won't make any sense. Okay, please. Um, well, let me do it from the, from the, the uh, 
the monograph instead. Um, Patients should be observed for neuropsychiatric symptoms or worsening of pre-existing psychiatric illness, e.g. schizophrenia, depression. Just slow down when you read. She got to slow she, down. She's got to take Way. it all down. I just started. Patients should be observed for neuropsychiatric symptoms or worsening of pre-existing psychiatric illness, e.g. schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder, during treatment with valenicline due to some serious neuropsychiatric symptoms reported during use of the drug. Post-marketing reports have included mood or behavioral changes or a psychiatric event such as a psychosis, hallucinations, paranoia, delusions, homicidal ideation, hostility, agitation, anxiety, panic, mania, depression, suicidal ideation, suicide attempt and completed suicide in patients with or without a psychiatric history. Now, um, the EGLE study was a study done by the company in psychotic patients. They were either schizoaffective or schizophrenic. Uh, they were selected for the study on that basis and they were all under psychiatric treatment taking antipsychotic drugs, they were all stable. And if they had had an episode, a return of psychosis or other mental illness in the previous months prior to the giving of them uh, brianocline, then they were excluded from the study. So this study is based on folks who are schizophrenic or schizoaffective but are actively being treated and haven't had a recent episode. That's correct. And the company reported that, um, on balance, varenicline was safe in those people who were actively under medicated antipsychotic control and mood control and um, monitored by therapists. However, um, even in that study, more patients in the varenicline treated psychiatric cohort had serious neuropsychiatric events involving a psychiatric hospitalization in patients receiving a placebo, even in the EGLE study, according to a review that I am reading. Um, but the FDA agreed that the black box warning could be removed. Let me ask you then, um, let me change subjects and ask you, have you reviewed um, Tim's uh, psychiatric drug um, or what he has been uh, prescribed as far as psychiatric drugs since he has been placed in custody? Yes, I have. I don't have it in front of me, but I, I'm familiar with what he's been taking. And one of those um, drugs is Geodon? It is. Who is that made on? Kaiser, ironically. And it appears he's been on that since September of 2014? Yes, sir. Is Geodon, is that taken recreationally? Absolutely not, or not to my knowledge. I can't imagine anyone wanting to. Is it not a pleasurable experience? Can you describe that to the jury? Uh, it is, uh, unless you're suffering from psychotic agitation, you would find the uh, effect of geodon suffocating. Um, it would be oppressively tranquilizing. Um, clouding of consciousness, uh, blunting of mood. Um, uh, it blunts euphoria, which is why it's also useful in bipolar disorder and mania. Um, it, would be, it, it would be quite unpleasant, as far as I'm aware. Besides those side effects, does it have any physical kind of side effects, potentially? There is a risk with all of these drugs less so with geodon than some of the early ones, of producing brain damage. Uh, you can see the effects of it when the drug med is still being given as a kind of trauma, uh, an extra pyramidal syndrome. Um, there are, it, the, the muscles may also be affecting the mouth and the tongue and the neck, which can affect voice. Uh, speed of thought is clouded slowed, 
Um, world finding ability is, is impaired. There are neuropsychological impairments across the board. Um, however, some of the effects on the striatum of the brain can be permanent. And uh, tardive dyskinesia is, is the, uh, the one that we worry about, which is a sort of Parkinsonian synd syndrome. You do not use this drug unless the risks and benefits are carefully weighed. And uh, in a person who doesn't need it psychiatrically, there are no benefits. All there is is risks. No physician would do that. So would you have an opinion as a, about a physician if they would give Giodon to someone who didn't need it? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for speculation outside the scope. I think it's within the scope, and I think he's already answered a question very similar to that as a follow-up, so I'm going to allow it, so overruled. Uh, that would be a song. Malpractice? Yes. Now, there had been some talk about half-lives. What is the half-life of geodon? It's quite short. Um, unlike some of the older, uh, more established antipsychotic drugs, the effect of the drug dissipates over about um, eight hours. So the drug is given regularly, daily, and in some patients that clear it a little more quickly than others due to their metabolism, they are very, very ready for the next dose because their symptoms are already returning. Now, this is quite different from some of the other longer-acting longer older drugs. Uh, in some cases, they only need to be given once a day. Um, in some cases, once every two weeks. But with geodon, you can't miss a dose. Uh, it is critical that you not miss a dose. You must carry the dose with you so that you do not miss the dose. And so potentially there could be effects or ramifications if I miss, say, two days? There would be, yes, as you would expect. Not only uh, uncovering of the underlying illness, but because the underlying illness has been kept under control, suppressed by the drug, therapeutically and, and benevolently, um, there is a risk of what we call rebound psychosis when the drug is discontinued or withdrawn. And rebound psychosis can be even worse than the underlying condition was before treatment began until it stabilizes. And so, doctor, do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of certainty in neuropharmacology how Tim's drug use would have affected his thinking and behavior at the time of his killing of his children? Yes, I do. Can you tell me that? It would have exacerbated his underlying psychiatric illness. That's all the questions I have, Your Honor. Please. questions uh, for you, Dr. Lipman, to follow up on what he was just asking you about the drug Geodon. Since we're in between uh, direct and cross, sure is asking for a break, and we'll give it to them because I can use one myself. So when y'all are ready to come back in, tell them we'll bring you back in here because it's ready for you. We won't be.